Tonight it is my joy and privilege to introduce to you Mistress Sadie Bryce from Ansland, Glasgow, who has come expressly to share her personal testimony of her marvellous conversion to the Lord Jesus Christ from that very dark world of spiritualism. May God bless her, richly as she does so. I thank you for this wonderful, glorious opportunity that you've given me here tonight in this lovely church. The opportunity to speak about my Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know tonight that I stand here and I speak with the authority that he has given me, mm -hmm. not my own authority. I speak as a child of God. And as we were singing that hymn there, where it says, Would you do service for Jesus your King? And my answer to that is, yes, I would. Yes, I would, a million times over. This Jesus came into my life and he transformed it. Utterly transformed it. He has done many wonderful things for me. And I would just like to share it with you tonight. Sometimes I'm glad I'm not a preacher. <laughs> I'm just an ordinary Glasgow housewife. And I don't know any theology at all. <laughs> I think all I know is that I'm saved. I know the Lord Jesus Christ and I know what he has done for me to make it possible that one day I'll see him face to face. And that door in heaven that I'll be able to go through. And that's just about all I know. But I know this, that he loves me. And I say tonight before I even begin to share with you that I love this Lord Jesus with all my heart. And that's really why I'm here tonight. To share the wonder of him. To tell you that Jesus is alive. To tell you that Jesus loves you with a tremendous, overwhelming love. And these are all the things that he's brought into my life. In many ways, I'm only a Christian eight years. And one thing I'm so thankful for, it's not religion I've got in my life. It's a person, a wonderful person. And he is the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, as I said, I was just an ordinary Glasgow housewife. I haven't really been anybody in particular, never at any time. In actual fact, I'm a Geordie from Newcastle in time. That's where I was born. And I didn't have a particularly bright childhood. I had grandparents who came down to visit one time and they found me that I was black and blue. And they brought me over the border and decided that they would bring me up with them. And I had wonderful grandparents. And I was then brought up here in Scotland, in Glasgow. And I've never left Glasgow since, because I've loved it, and I love the people. And, of course, I met a wonderful Glasgow chap. You know, Glasgow's got great guys, and I met one of them. <laughs> I did. And I was about 19, and he was 21. And we got married. And then we were separated during the war. But when we came back together again, the love that we first had in the beginning was still there. And we, we started a family. I have one daughter, Helena, and she's still with me today. And I would say that this husband of mine, he did put me sometimes on a pedestal, but that was in a place where I didn't deserve to be. I was one of those wives that I finally convinced him what he should do. It was really the way I wanted it, and I had him finishing up thinking it really all the time was the way he wanted it. And we had a good relationship between us. And you know, you think that life is going to go on like that. My husband's really a worker, one of the old school. He said he would never be out of a job. He would do anything. And he had worked since he left school at 12 years of age. 
and we had a, a good, happy home life. We never had over much. There was always that day short in the week where we sat down to one potato made into a plate of chips. But you know, other things that were important were in that house. We loved the child that we brought into the world. We loved her. And I thought life would go on like that. But you see, life doesn't always go on the way that we think it will. As so many things happen to us. And I think the first blow that I ever had in my life was for my husband just took a pain in his leg. And I, I wasn't too particularly worried about that. I chased him to the doctors. I said, well, over you go to the doctor. He was taken into hospital, tests were taken, and it was discovered he had secondary cancer. Too far gone to do anything about it. And they gave him five months to live. Well, I came home that day from the hospital. They didn't tell my husband. They gave him every hope that he was going to get out there and he'd be back on his feet and everything in the world would be fine for him. They took me into a small room. And when I came out of that small room with this knowledge, I came home with a half realization, what, what do you do in a circumstance like this? Your world is crumpling round about you. I was a woman who didn't know God. I was a woman who didn't go to church. So therefore you would say I was a woman with no hope in my life. And the only life that I knew, which centered around my husband and my home, was just coming to pieces round about me. Well, he came home, and I think that the cardiology that the hospital had started, I found myself in the position with my heart breaking, that I also had to carry this on. I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know what else to do. And as the weeks passed, it turned into 24 hour round the clock nursing, day and night. You just didn't go to bed. At the end of the five months, my husband died at home. I wouldn't have had it any other way. He died at home, and I remember that particular day. The sun was shining through the window. And as I looked at my daughter, I said, you know, Helena, the sun out there in the world is shining on everybody in the world today. But I said, it's not shining on you and I. Little did I know, it's not this, just the sun in the sky we looked to. But after the funeral, and even that, I had to ask someone, would they find me a minister to conduct the funeral service? I didn't know any. And the first year, I say the first year was a terrible year. I won't kid on about that one. I wanted to commit suicide. I wanted to opt out of things. Life held nothing for me. I used to go out late at night, put my coat on and walk up and down the Great Western Road Boulevard. I didn't know where I was walking to or where I was going. I was a lost soul. And little did I know I was a lost soul in more ways than that. My neighbours told me afterwards that they didn't like to speak to me because they weren't sure what to say to me. And I had a very shut away look. I don't believe I encouraged anyone to speak to me. Well, the first year, I was amazed that I got the first year in. Because day followed day, week after week. And there I still was. Then suddenly there came a moment when I said, Sadie, you've got to pull your socks up. And then I looked at my daughter. Do you know, strangely, in some strange way that whole year, I hadn't looked at my daughter. She had lost a father, and that was something that escaped me. I was so wrapped up selfishly in my loss that I didn't consider. Hers was a great loss also. She lost it, her dad. Well, during this interval, 
I began to settle down to things. And I was going over to the library and I was reading quite a lot of books. And strangely, I seemed to be always drawn towards the one type of book. And it was on spiritualism. And all I seemed to be saying was proof. Here's the proof and here's the proof. And I began to read these books. And I began to wonder, was there anything in it? Then, one Sunday morning, I often say now that Satan knows what to tempt you with. Each one of us has a different temptation. He knows what to tempt you with, and he also knows the time to tempt you. And as I went over to the library for books, I had a very strong feeling that I was always being led to these books. Although it didn't disturb me, but it didn't frighten me. The next thing was one of my friends, her husband died, and I went along to see her. And as I consoled her in her grief and tried to help her to go over it, we began a conversation together, and she said, I have heard that you can get in touch with the dead. And I said, well... Yes, I believe I've heard that also. I said, I've been reading a couple of books on it. Well, she said, I've heard there's another way. That if you get a a glass and leave it, put it in the center of the table and put letters round about it. She said, you know, there's a possibility that we could get in touch with them. Well, her and I began to play this, what is known as the Ouija board. And it works. And we didn't realize that we were opening ourselves up to a world of evil. Such a world of evil. Now, in the Spiritualist Association today, they'll tell you, and it sounds good, and they'll say, don't play with a Ouija board because you'll call up bad spirits. But I would like to say here and now that the same evil spirits behind the Ouija board is the same evil spirits behind spiritualism. There is no difference. They're the same. Satan will take you from the first step onto the next and the next. It's just right into his territory. And that's what happened with me. After playing the Ouija board, I picked up the evening paper one night. And here was church notices. It still grieves me today when I look at church notices and I see these places sitting side by side with our Christian churches. And as I looked at that column, I noted the advert for the Spiritualist Church at Charing Cross in Somerset Place. And I felt strangely that I had a tremendous urge that I wanted to go there. Little did I realize it was Satan that was doing the urging. And I put down the paper, and I got ready, put my coat on, and I went into that hall. Here I was faced with the same thing again as I had been reading in the books. People on a platform, and the whole place looked like a church. I had no fear whatsoever that I was walking into a place that God condemns utterly. On walking in the door, I was handed a hymn book. And the opening of the service, as they call it, they make a mockery of the church. They open with a word of prayer. And they pray. Now, this prayer is a prayer of blasphemy because it calls upon God to help them and assist them in getting in touch with the spirits when we know that God's word expressly forbids it. So it's a prayer of blasphemy it opens with. They then continue the service, only the service then is not a Christian service. They give you messages. And I may add that it is very, very real indeed. And I can see why thousands of people today are being drawn into this world of the occult. Because... Through one spiritist medium on that platform alone, I was given a message, supposedly from my husband, and I believed it. 
And that medium succeeded in projecting over to me my husband's very, what would I say, his personality, his character, everything, and just what she said. That I immediately said, that's my husband. So you can see how deceitful it is and how people can be easily drawn into this. Well, I became a very faithful attender at Somerset Place, Charing Cross. It's one of the head spiritualist places. And I was amazed at the information that these mediums could give out. And of course, as I sat with a hymn book and sung a hymn, I never at any time felt afraid or knew any fear because somehow I comforted myself that it all must have something to do with God. I mean, singing hymns and opening with a word of prayer and somehow I felt it had all to do with God. Well, one day one of the mediums said, she said, you're going to be given a gift, Sadie. She said, I think it's a gift of healing. And of course, immediately, my ego responded to that one. And I said, my, that's marvelous. You mean I can pray for somebody and they'll be healed? And yes, a gift of healing. But as it turned out, it wasn't a gift of healing I was given. And you know, today, today, it's not right to use the word gifts in association with these things. These are not gifts. They're abilities that are given to you by Satan. So the ability that I was given was clairvoyancy and clairaudience. Now, a lot of people well know what clairvoyancy is. But not many people know what clear audience is. Clear audience is a clear hearing, which means that I could stand on a platform, someone could stand beside me, you could stand beside me, and you wouldn't hear a single word of what I heard. But I had the ability to hear every word that that spirit would give me, a complete message. And how I received it, was the tone of voice and the level was the same as I'm speaking to you just now. And yet you would not have heard it. Only I would have heard it. That's clear audience. Now, clear audience and clear voice go together. One complements the other. So that you're, you're given the clear voice, you're told about a person, told where they are, and then you're also given the message to give to them. And this is how the mediums operate. And I'm going to say it now in case I should overlook the fact later that there is only one way that a human being, be it a man or a woman, can have these abilities. They are demon-possessed. Now today, we're living in the 20th century and maybe we've become too sophisticated and we think, oh my, I don't like to talk about these things. But I'm talking about them tonight because it happened to me. And as I say, I was just an ordinary Glasgow housewife who never dreamt there would be a day in my life when I would know what it was to be demon-possessed. Now that place was so full of evil, as I now know, and yet when I was in it, I was never aware of anything like this. Now I should add, why I had no awareness was because I didn't have God in my life. These people do not have God in their lives. Satan has them completely bound in darkness. Now, at first, as I said, this went for my ego, clairvoyancy. You see, when you're in the world, you have many unworthy thoughts. And I thought, look at the money you can make. You don't have to declare it all to the income tax. They'll never find out the half of it. This is the unworthy person you are when you're in the world. These were some of my thoughts. Plus, my ego was lifted. I remember walking along our Gulf Street in Glasgow one day and wondering, why had God so gifted me like this? Little did I know that God's curse was literally resting in my head at that moment as I walked along a girl street. Well, what changed my life and how God came into it and arrested me? 
I want to just praise God today that he did arrest me, was I didn't realize that I had no control now over my own life. Once you give yourself over like this, I didn't have the option to say I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. But I wasn't aware of that. Until one day, a friend who had a taxi hire business at Annie's Land Cross in Glasgow, a very nice chap, Stuart, he came along and he said, Sadie, I need a receptionist. He says, I'm desperate for a receptionist and work's piling up on me. He said, have you got the time to come along and help me out? And suddenly I said, yes, Stuart, I'd love to come along. Now, wasn't that a simple thing? A very simple thing in my life. Well, I said to Stuart, I'll come along tomorrow and I'll see you. And I'll meet your brother. And if he approves of me also, then I said, that'll be fine. The next day, I went along to Stuart's little shop at Annie's Land Cross. And I, I loved both brothers when I met them. And uh, they said, can you start tomorrow, Sadie? I said, yes, I can. I'll be along tomorrow. <clears throat> now, half of me inside, there were thoughts that when I said yes to Stuart and his brother, there was a little part in me that was also saying at that time, I don't know that I want to go on with all that. I don't know that I really do. So I came out and I walked towards the bus stop, quietly thinking like this, when suddenly it was like all hell was let loose on top of me. As I reached the 20 bus stop, the Annie's Land Cross, where the spirits had been friendly before, they now turned positively unfriendly. And all their hate and all their evil that they really have for you and I, they hate mankind, they hate people, because God has created you. And they hate us with their terrible evil. They began to show themselves then in their true colours. Now, where before I had received their voices, and I admit it, I received it, and I spoke back to them, and I answered them. This was a moment when I did not want them to speak to me, but I discovered that I had no control over the situation whatsoever, none whatsoever. They began to threaten me as I stood there. They threatened me what, what they would do if I tried to turn away from all this. It was incredible, incredible. I never realized that all this was behind it. Well, I tried to think about something else and shut them out of myself, shut them out of my thoughts, and that I didn't hear them speaking to me. And I found it was impossible. I was losing the battle. Now, I was so losing the battle that I reached a point where I wanted to scream. And I really mean scream. And there was people standing on either side of me, to the left, to the right. And they never knew what I was going through that day. And suddenly I thought, if I scream here, they'll put me in hospital. They'll give me drugs. And giving me drugs would have hidden what was wrong with me. And it wouldn't have helped me. And suddenly I thought, if this goes on any longer, I will scream. Because suddenly it came into my mind that I was just a human being. And somehow I didn't feel that anyone had any right to do this to me. To literally beat me into the gutter where I stood in that pavement. And I thought, no, I'm a human being. And no one should have the right to do this to me. No one. But you see, they were doing it because I had walked in forbidden territory. And in that moment, God began to come into my life. And I'll tell you how he came in. He came in with his word. And as I didn't know his words, then he had to give them to me. He had to place them in my mind. Now, they were controlling my thoughts, and I couldn't even think my own thoughts, which is a terrible thing to happen to a human being. I couldn't think them. And suddenly, into them came 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done upon this earth as it is in heaven. Deliver us from evil. And as I stood there and I began to say those words into myself, the evil which controlled my thoughts has no ground to stand on. When God's word comes into the situation, that evil must go. It departed. And suddenly I was just a woman again that could, could think my own thoughts, as I call it. But I still held on to those words of the Lord's Prayer. Well, the 20 bus came along. And I remember jumping on the bus. I, I got my fears out. And I'm still saying, Our Father, which art in heaven. But you know, at that moment, I do believe I was using them more in a sort of magic way. I really was. I'm being truthful because I don't think the sovereign God had really come into my vision. All I knew was these words did something and I was just going to hold on to them. And hold on to them I did till I got home. Now, I live in a multi-story flat, nine up. And for the first time in my life, as I stepped towards my door, I was suddenly afraid. Afraid to put the key in the door of my own house. Why? Why? Because of memories in that house. Because of knowing that their presence was in the house, not just mine. I was always conscious that the spirits were around me and telling me to do things. And suddenly I was afraid. I didn't want to enter into my own house. But I plucked up all my courage. I plucked up my courage and forced myself to get the key in the door. And as I put my key in the door and walked into the house, God was still with his eye on the whole situation. Oh, I just thank God today. And as I entered into my living room, you know, I stood in the middle of the living room floor and I began to know fear like I never knew fear in my life before. Fear. I felt evil was just all around me. It was going to attempt to overwhelm me. And suddenly I was so afraid I wanted to run. Run somewhere. Run for help. And first of all I thought, well I run to a neighbour's door and well I tell her I need help. And I thought, no, my neighbours wouldn't understand. Then I thought of the doctor. I've got a very nice doctor. And I thought, I'll go over and I'll tell my doctor that, I, I look, I just don't want all this clairvoyancy. I don't want it. And I could just picture my doctor's face in that moment, you know, looking at me. And a prescription being made out. And I could just imagine he would say... Mrs. Bryce, you take these tablets and I'll see you in a couple of weeks' time. And something within me told me, that's not the answer. That's not the answer. And still this fear overwhelmed me. Where to run to? And then I thought of a church. I'm surrounded by quite a few churches at Knightswood. And I thought, there's good people in a church. I'll go there. They'll help me. But as I thought about a church... It's seven o'clock at night in the winter time. It was dark. I could see the church gates, big iron gates, and they were closed, they were locked, and there was a chain across and a padlock. And I thought, by the time I go there and I try to find out who's the minister of that church, then I would have to go and look and see where did he live. And suddenly I thought, it's hopeless. Hopeless. And still this fear overwhelmed me. Then very quietly, I often say this, that the Lord Jesus is very, very gentle. Very, very gentle. I believe if I had met Christians, they might have just told me to my face, you're demon-possessed and you need deliverance. And I just don't know quite what that would have did to my mind at that particular point. But I do know that this is the way that Jesus did it. He pointed my eyes to a small transistor set at the side of the fireplace. And as I looked at this transistor set, I realized there was voices come out of it, there was music come out of it, 
And yet, if I passed my hand round it, there was no wires. Well, I stood in the middle of my living room floor and I looked at myself from head to foot and I thought, well, there's no wires around me. So how have I got this clairvoyancy? How have I got this ability? Where is it coming from? I began to question. And as I began to question, God spoke to me. And this is what God said. And this is what God says in his word, the Bible. And God will never change his word because his word is fixed in heaven. He says, put all these things away from you. They are an abomination in my sight. Now at that moment, I wouldn't have known what the abominations were. I didn't. But the Holy Spirit led me to the spiritless magazines that were around my living room. And I found myself picking them up and tearing them across. And I went into the kitchenette and I threw them in my kitchenette bin. And suddenly I was convicted. I was convicted. But from that moment, I would have stood helpless, still not knowing what to do next. And you know, in the Bible, it tells you that Jesus is the great and the mighty counsellor. And that, in that moment, was what he became to me, the mighty counsellor. He first of all counselled to put the abominations away from me. And although I was a woman of 54 years of age, I became like a five-year-old child because it was like someone taking my hand and leading me right through my own house to my bedroom. And it's a little bedroom at the end of the hall, which in actual fact is Helena's bedroom, my daughter's bedroom. And there's a Bible there. And God knew there was a Bible there. But it belonged to my mother-in-law. She was a very good woman. He led me to that Bible. And I threw myself down on the side of that bed on my knees, still not knowing that I was being held in the power of God and as I threw myself down to my knees at the side of the bed with a Bible in my hands, I cried out for the first time in my life. I cried out to the living God. And I said, oh God, please, please help me. I said, I don't understand and I don't know what all these things are that's happening round about me. I, I, I truthfully didn't. And all I could say was, oh God, please help me. Please help me. And as I cried out, please help me. You know what? His very presence was in that bedroom. It was like the woman in the Bible who reached out and she touched the hem of his garment. And I know that night that I touched the hem of Jesus' garment. His love and his forgiveness, oh, they're so tremendous. But you see, I still had something else to do and I still didn't know it. And as I just waited a couple of minutes, knowing that the presence of the Lord was in that bedroom, he placed in my mouth the words that would reconcile me back to my heavenly father. I didn't know I was separated from my heavenly father by a wall, by a barrier of sin. Not just spiritualism. It's because God's word says I was a sinner. And God showed me the way back. He showed me the way back. He gave me the words. And these are the words. He placed them in my mouth. And I found myself saying, Father, forgive me. I have walked in wrong paths. And immediately I asked for that forgiveness. That forgiveness was immediately given to me. Immediately. And I'll tell you that was a wonderful thing. Even for me to say father. I said it because you see. I was illegitimate. And I didn't know until I was 21 years of age. When I looked for my certificate. There's only the name Sadie on it. But I just thank God today that that he knows the babies that are born and that are hardly given a name. 
You know, there was a day in my life, before I was a Christian, I used to wonder about the Bible too. I used to think an awful lot of books have gone out of print, but this one seems to have been around for an awful long time. And as a Christian today, I know it will be around because it's the hand of God and the voice of God that's on it. Well, I found a wonderful saviour, but he had a lot of work to do with me. When I went to bed that night, I took my Bible with me. I wouldn't let it go, because God had spoken to me through it, and I just wouldn't let it go. And as I got into bed, I put it under my pillow, and I put my hand on top of it. I just knew how precious it was. But as I put my head on the pillow, the enemy moved in on me. And they began to try to reach me in my thoughts again and hammer home what they wanted to say to me. And again, this is what God was able to do for me that night. It's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. As they attempted to put a word into my mind and reach me, God was laying verses of scripture into my thoughts that I didn't even know. And all I knew was they were out of the Bible, although I didn't know them. And these words kept being laid into my, my head. And quietly, the Lord gave me this lovely psalm. And I lay there and I began to say, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And suddenly, I got a vision of the Lord at the side of my bed with a table and he seemed to be laying things on this table and I thought Lord that's for me you're laying something on a table for me and he let me know that I could close my eyes and fall asleep because the battle was his and as I fell asleep and I had one of the best sleeps I ever had in my life that night as I fell asleep I was very conscious that there was a battle going on, but I didn't have to worry about it. And once I got my Christian feet together, I began to read of how the victory belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love that verse of scripture. Thanks be to God who has given us this victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our feet stand in the victory all the time. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Wonderful. Well, after that beautiful sleep, the Lord waited for me to waken up in the morning. And he reminded me after I'd prayed that when he said, put all these things away from you, he meant all. So he brought back to my remembrance, there was a drawer in the, my own bedroom in the house which contained all my husband's things. And the spiritist mediums had said, now say, do you leave those things in that drawer? Because your husband will give back messages and he'll tell you who you're to give this stuff to. Who he wants his gold watch to go to and who he wants to have this and what have you. And I said, all right. I was quite obedient to that and I left all those things in the drawer. But God had other plans for those things. And he directed me to take the same bucket again and get through to the bedroom and begin to take everything out of that drawer. And as I went through, I began to empty the drawer. And you know, suddenly, gold watches and all these things, my goodness, what are the things of the world? And you count them with the things of God, which are much more precious. And I just began to throw everything into the bucket as the Holy Spirit directed me. But there was one thing, one thing only was left in that drawer, and it was a Bible. It was a Bible even I had forgotten was there. Now, that Bible belonged to my husband. It dated away back to he was a boy, and he was also an officer in the Boys Brigade. And it was a BB Bible. And of course, as I had, immediate, as I had found the Lord the night before, a Bible to me was a Bible. So I turned to put this Bible back in the drawer because the drawer was empty. It was now all in the bucket. And God would not allow me to put that Bible back in the drawer. <clears throat> now I tried three times and I couldn't understand 
why I seem to be getting held by this power in the middle of the bedroom floor. And the only other alternative that I could face was this bucket. He knows the babies where the earthly fathers won't own them. But my father in heaven, he's the greatest father. I shouldn't have spent so much time in my life looking for my earthly one. I should have been looking for my heavenly one, my heavenly father. So that day when I said, Father, forgive me, it was a wonderful moment. And it was then I realized that if I was now calling God Father, then I must be his daughter. Well, I'll tell you, I was so thrilled with that. I was so thrilled and so happy. And that was the beginning of a new relationship for me, the beginning of a new life. Because in that moment, God took away from me all my drinking habits, he took away from me my 60 cigarettes a day. He took away from me all clairvoyancy, clairaudience, every filthy thing which had touched upon me. And as I wept before him in his presence, I began to know the truth, and this was the truth, as Jesus showed it to me. I wasn't kneeling in my bedroom at the side of my bed. I was kneeling at the foot of the cross at Calvary. Because that's where your new life begins. You've got to get to the foot of the cross at Calvary and know there that Jesus died for you. And the blood that he shed is to cleanse you from the filth and the dirt that I walked in and that other people are walking in today because Satan has them in his power. But I thank God today that the blood of Jesus availed for me. And I knew in that moment in that bedroom that no matter what I had done, no matter what I had done, and you know, the Lord let me see myself as he had seen me over the years, and I was overwhelmed with shame. And I wept, and I wept. I really wept that day. I never wept so much, but as I wept, there was a beautiful cleansing process began to take place inside of me. A beautiful cleansing took place. And I began to ask him questions. And my first question was, because I, I found that this feeling I had been brought into a safe haven. I was home. I, I, as if I'd been lost in a cold, dark, lonely place and I'd been found. And I said, Lord, how did you know I was lost? What a question to ask the Lord. Because I imagined this world with us all in it. And I was just a wee speck down there. And I just didn't know how he had noticed the trouble that I was in. And he let me know that if I opened the Bible, he would speak to me. And as I opened the Bible... He told me the story about the 99 sheep had all been gathered in. That the shepherds had gone out looking for that one, that one. And as he told me that, I somehow felt suddenly, he let me know how precious I was to him. How precious. And how much he loved me. Just the same as tonight, every one of you are very precious to him. And he loves you. I asked him many more questions. But one of the ones, one of the things I said to him was, I says, Lord, I see my life now as you have looked upon me. I said, and I don't like what I see. And I'm sorry about it. I'm really sorry. And I said, I, I, I really feel dreadful about it. And he kept telling me just to keep opening the Bible and he would keep speaking to me. And he said, I didn't come, he said, to save the righteous. I came, he said, to bring sinners to repentance. Well, I just went on weeping and weeping because he just kept talking to me through his work. I'll tell you today, I'm sorry if anyone's got a book like this called the Bible and they've got it on their shelf and it's gathering dust and they don't read it. Because this is the living word of God. This is the voice of God. This is for 
his people, for you and I today. This is the most wonderful book in the world. Well, I began to weep and cry. And I said, please, please, Lord, don't ask me to throw away a Bible. I said, I know you want me to clear all these things out, but I said, don't ask me to throw away a Bible because I can't do it, and neither I could. And I stood there helplessly. But you know, our sovereign God has a wonderful way of getting the message across to you and reaching you. And as I stood and cried about that, asking him not to ask me to throw away a Bible, he had something to teach me here. And quietly he said, open it. And as I opened this Bible, both pages on either side, I got the shock of my life. <clears throat> there was a big dark brown stain on either page. No human eye could have read a word on it. Now I got a shock and I couldn't believe it. And I went like that through the whole book. And every page of that Bible had a dirty, filthy, dark brown stain on it. And suddenly, what God had wanted me to do from the very beginning, I did in that moment. Suddenly that Bible became a, a, a dirty, unclean Bible in my hands, and I threw it in the bucket. Now that might surprise some people who think that all Bibles are Bibles that God will use, but they're not. And if anyone has used a Bible in conjunction with a Ouija board, do not expect God to honor that Bible, because he will not. That Bible must be destroyed. And counsel anyone like that that comes out of the world of darkness. God has nothing to do with a world of darkness in any way at all. And anything which has touched upon you, your life, your home, God wants it all completely cleansed. And that was a lesson for me. But you see how wonderful. It's no trouble to the Lord to reach us and let us know what he wants us to do. I continued after that, and I met with Christian people. And when I told them what had happened to me, they realized also that I was partly in a state of shock. I think anyone coming out of that evil world of spiritualism and darkness is in a state of shock to realize that you can walk past these places and never realize how active Satan is within them. You see, this world is filled with many false cults and religions. But I consider spiritualism to be one of the more deadly ones because in spiritualism, you are having converse with these evil, unclean spirits. You're having fellowship with them. You're allowing them to speak to you and tell you what to do, and you're answering and you're being obedient to them. This is why spiritualism is one of the greatest evils that we have in our midst here today. And if you have any friends or relatives who think that spiritualism holds something, tell them that there is nothing of God in spiritualism. Nothing of God. God condemns it right throughout the Bible. His word says, seek not after mediums to be defiled by them. Utter condemnation of God is upon it. Now, I would like to say to comfort anyone who's ever had any doubts put into their mind that we are not in touch with the spirits of the dead. It's a diabolical lie of Satan. And he set up spirits with them. And a very diabolical evil in the midst of us. And I can tell you now, God would not permit such a thing to happen. Would not permit it. I think, I was trying to think if there was anything else I would like to warn you about with regard to spiritualism, but I think I've said enough about that. I would like more to praise the Saviour who brought me out of darkness into his glorious light. And Jesus says, know the truth 
and the truth will set you free. And I can tell you, I know that freedom. I know that freedom tonight. I've got the freedom to worship Jesus. I've got the freedom to sing and praise his name. And it's wonderful, really wonderful. And I just hope that God will always use my testimony. Because I'll never stop telling people how wonderful the Lord Jesus is. To say that he has a wee special corner for the widows. Well, there was a day when he had that wee special corner for me as a widow. You know, I think he sees women when we lose our husbands. No longer can we kind of lean on them and turn to them. And I do believe that, that the Lord has a wee special corner for the widows. So thank you for, for listening so attentively. And I hope tonight that your thoughts won't be in anything in connection with spiritualism that I have said. I hope your thoughts tonight of being a God that can come into a man or a woman's life and turn them round about to face him. That's the person to think about, the Lord Jesus, who went all the way to Calvary for you and I. And stop to think for a moment that even without Christians being present, God is well able to speak to his people at any time when he wants to. So thank you for listening.